I hope you enjoyed your lunch and rested a bit because we are now continuing with the program. Next up is Nicola, who will be the moderator of this next session. So please welcome Nicola to the stage. Okay, hi everyone, again. So they say that the after lunch session is the best one or the worst one, depending on the way you look at it. The problem is that since we've already eaten, the blood's gone down from the brain to the stomach. So you usually cannot pay attention that well, which as a speaker is not so good, but if you have stage fright, then it's great. Nobody will notice if you do something bad. That's why after lunch, you usually have some very energetic session like the one Steli had that is very positive, very optimistic, and we're not gonna do that. Actually, this presentation is gonna be sort of a reality check. My guest today is maybe the most shared speaker we're having this year. He's labeled by some as a hero and by some as a villain. He was described even as notorious for the things he's done. I wouldn't put it like that. He's an artist. He's an activist. He's a vegan. When they asked him, he said, I'm a bad activist, I'm a bad comedian, but I'm a very good pessimist. Most of you know him as the founder of Pirate Bay. So I guess this basically means thank you for the freedom, thank you for the programs, thank you. Who am I kidding? Thank you for the free porn. Peter Sunde, everyone. So I think this works. They didn't give me a clicker, but I have one here, so. Hello, everyone. Espa. So I'm trying my Bosnian here. It didn't work that well. Uh, so my name is Peter. He already presented me. I think I'm... And went off. This happened all the time. Okay, so a little bit. I'm gonna talk a little bit depressive, but it's gonna be entertaining for some of you. Uh, so I started with computers very, very, very early. I'm 36, so I'm super old, and when I tell people how old I am, they run away from me. No, 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 no. I was talking to a 21-year-old person yesterday, and she ran when I said I was 36. Uh, but that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. It's nice. So serious and let's hope this works a little bit better. Um, so I, I was growing up and I, as you were doing it. Do you have another microphone maybe? Maybe you can have one of these that's just wireless if you have one. Because this has been going on all day. Oops. So, you can hear me now. Yay! I'm sorry for you, now you have to listen to me. Okay, so growing up, I started copying lots of stuff, and it was really the only way for me to learn to do anything. And you are probably in the same situation as I was back then, that people don't really care about markets or anything in this region. They don't care about finding you like Netflix or anything. Spotify is probably not available here. So if you want to actually have something, uh, if you want to participate in kind of the cultural heritage, uh, you have to legally share that information. I think that's great, because you can now just ignore all of those idiots. Uh, so growing up, I realized that we are basically copies of each other. We emulate what other people are doing. We download information from the internet. And it's the way we become humans. And I'm really into humans. I think that's awesome. So uh, I was really upset because I, I realized that 
people in Hollywood did not like the, the way of life that I had. Like they de decided that it's not good. And I'm going to show you my my first real uh, kind of understanding of like there is a fight between us and Hollywood. Hopefully this works. Oh, no sound? Come on. What? But this is the real world. We need your help. When you buy pirated movie and music, you support criminals. Now these criminals are counterfeiting other things, like electronics and medicine. Take action. They demand the real thing. Help us stop piracy. Let's terminate it. And so every time I see it, I get really upset about it. Because the problem is, this is real. It's not a joke at all. They were actually thinking, if you download things from the internet, you're supporting terrorists and criminals and so on. I never understood it, because you don't pay for it. So where does the money go? Well, uh, you can kind of not figure that out. So I, I joined a group in Sweden called Piratbyrån, which was uh, an, a small activist, artist, activist, hacker, uh, philosophers, kind of a mix-up of a lot of different people. And we did a lot of uh, interesting things. First of all, Pirat Biron means the Bureau for Piracy. And the name comes from the anti-Pirat Biron, which was the one that was started before us. They were against piracy. So we copied their name and we remixed their name and took away the, the crappy parts, the anti-stuff, and we became the new original. And they were really upset about that. And because everyone was asking them, why did you start this group against these people? And they're like, no, we were against them before they existed. And I was like, it was so confusing to them. And we did a lot of these different uh, kind of uh, projects that were confusing to a lot of people. So we have, yeah, we've done a lot of uh, the TV shows, we've done a lot of uh, technology stuff, we've gone out protesting on, on certain uh, first of May demonstrations and so on. But the thing that became really, really popular that's, and why I'm here is because of Pirate Bay. Um, you can clap if you want to. I, I realize that you've used it before. And Pirate Bay was just like, a, for us it was just a way to actually show the world that you can use another technology for file sharing instead of using direct file transfers between computers as you did before, um, which was very centralized and very excluding. Because we are all about including people, like everyone has the right to be included in file sharing and in freedom of information, which is why I'm not super happy about what's happening on the internet. Pirate Bay was not really the best technology, it was not a good website, it's super fucking ugly. Uh, we, we copied Google and made it even worse than what Google looks like somehow. Uh, but that was kind of our thinking, let's make it simple and we don't care if it's ugly or not, it's just going to work anyhow. Uh, we didn't become big on technology. Uh, we had a lot of competitors that were bigger than Pirate Bay in the beginning. And we were happy because there was lots of different websites that had different uh, agendas with what they were doing. So there was music file sharing systems, there were film file sharing systems, everything. And Pirate Bay was the place you went to when you had nowhere else to go, when you didn't find that very specific thing that you were interested in. But the thing that made us really special was that we decided to not close down when there was pressure. So Hollywood and the music industry started sending out all of these letters to, to people saying you have to close down or we're going to sue you for more money than actually exists in the world. And they were really serious about it. Uh, we did something else when the letters came. We decided we're going to publish them, the letters, on our website so people can see the way that the people are, are, are pressing our culture. And we're going to reply to all of them and we're going to send words back about what we think about them. So this is one of the most famous things where we're explaining that we're in Sweden, which is not part of the United States, and we don't have the same uh, laws as you have and so on, and you go fuck yourself with a baton in your ass. <laughs> and the tension we got from this was very, uh, let's say, interesting. Uh, one of my favorite things we did is that we sent a picture of a polar bear to DreamWorks. Uh, they were upset about people downloading Shrek or something like that, which is an awful movie. I'm also upset about people downloading Shrek for a different reason. Uh, it's called Taste. Uh, but we sent this, uh, this polar bear back to them and, and they were like confused. What, what, how can you reply with just a picture of a polar bear? And well, I told them like, yeah, you have problems with copyright. We live in, in Scandinavia and we have polar bears trying to eat us. We have different problems. We are more obsessed with these. And they don't realize, do they actually have polar bears in Scandinavia? And the answer is no, we don't. But people think that, so that's why we went with it. Um, 
we published all of the letters, as I said, uh, and there was quite a few letters that was interesting for us, and we tried to have like a new kind of humorous spin on it, because we wanted people to understand that this is not right, and you can actually say no to people trying to control you. Because for us, it was all about control of the internet and infrastructure. This is my favorite one, and it's because it's so fucking clever. Uh, so we got a letter from a German company that owns a lot of typefaces and fonts, so Helvetica and a lot of other different fonts. And they sent the letter uh, with a contract for us to sign and pay them lots of money so that uh, in order to not be sued over allowing people to download this. And we tried explaining to them, like, we don't actually have this information. It's between people. We're just a directory where you can uh, find other people that has the stuff. Uh, but they sent this contract anyhow. So we decided we're going to copy the contract uh, and just reverse it. So instead of us having to pay money, they should pay us money for bothering us and so on. So we just like they had like three different categories of stuff and blah, blah, blah. So we just copied all of that. And we, of course, used all of the fonts that they were complaining about. And they didn't reply. I wanted the, like, the follow-up to this, but that didn't happen. And for us, it was kind of it was entertaining, and for them, it was really, really annoying uh, because they couldn't control us. And we were only three people. And at the time when Pirate Bay was at the biggest, we were actually more than half of all of the traffic on the internet. Like half of the traffic was three people who didn't like each other, that was working against kind of a mutual enemy. And I'm going to show you like. When they're trying to figure out how to take down us, this is kind of how we're working. So I'm going to show you a clip from a, a documentary about Pirate Bay. And there's a, a guy I work with. I would not say he's my friend. Broke up is a fucking vegetarian leftist bitch ass bastard. He got bought because he's in the Pirate Bay, right? He's giving all the interviews. He's still a bitch. He does it because of ideological... Uh, Pussy in the afflicted instincts. He needs to look himself in the ass and take his own life in his hands. Om man är på riktigt har tagit en öl eller två, då blir han den jobbigaste människan på jorden. Och problemet är att han tar en eller två öl åtminstone varje dag. Yeah, these are the people we worked with. You know, it's really, really awful. So. We had one drug addict, one alcoholic, and then the third guy. You can figure out who's whom. Uh, and so they were, you know, trying to figure out who we were. And at the same time, we were doing all of these crazy projects. And we were playing with the idea that people think that we're serious because we have a lot of attention. So everyone thinks you're serious when you say something. So all of a sudden, because I realized one day that Pirate Bay actually ends in eBay, you know, the name. So let's say that we bought eBay because it would look funny. So we actually just published news saying that like, we bought eBay. And people were like, oh, did they? Wow. And we we're like, oh, OK, uh, people went for this. So we say we invaded a country called Ladonia. And people were like, we support them. You know, it's no such country, actually. Uh, but it was really funny and inter interesting to see. We actually told people that we, uh, we were hosted in North Korea twice. And the reason is that the US hates us. And they hate North Korea. And North Korea hates the US. So obviously, we should work together. And the second time we did it, we actually stole all of the North Korean IP addresses in the world and put Pirate Bay on one of those IP addresses because we know how to steal IP addresses on the internet. It was really entertaining. For like a week, people actually could not figure out how we did that. And they actually thought the only possible way of that being true is that we were actually hosted in, in uh, North Korea. Very funny things to do. Um, one time, we actually tried buying a country called Sealand. And we got to a certain level of like people understanding that people are taking us way too serious because we said like oh this 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 country called sealand it's an old platform outside of the uh, of the uk it's up for sale let's see if we can find people that wants to actually pay money and buy this country with us uh, so we did the first crowd financing campaign on the internet ever in 2007 something like that and we managed to get like fifty thousand dollars while being drunk um, and we tried buying it they wanted six billion but we had 50,000, and they didn't go for that. But the interesting thing was that all of a sudden, Larry King Show invited uh, the Prince of Sealand and some of the top lawyers in Hollywood to come and speak with the problem of us owning our own country, where we would abolish copyright and so on. Uh, so they took us way too serious, and we didn't really figure out like how far can we take this. So one time, we actually said we would put Pirate Bay on the stock exchange. Because everyone said we were doing this for business and so on, so let's, uh, let's put it on the stock exchange. Everyone can be a shareholder in Pirate Bay, so everyone can own us together. 
And it turned out a really funny art project. Someone got prison time for that because it, they were pumping up and down uh, you know, on the stock exchange and everything. It was really, really funny. Um, sad for some people, but it was still funny to play around with people. Um, then we started going into art because people said they must be artists, right? So they're doing all of these crazy things. So we bought a bus in Stockholm and we put lots of people that didn't know each other and we drove from northern uh, Sweden to all the way to southern uh, Italy and exhibited as art. And people were really confused. What is this? Is it art or not? And that means it is art because if you're not sure, it is art. Uh, so we got invited to the biggest art vinyl in the world. And of course we went there and um, we were thinking, what should we do if we we're at the biggest art festival in the world as artists? Because it's fun to be an artist. Uh, so we decided we're going to do something which has nothing to do with the internet at all. We uh, went there with uh, paperwork, actual uh, A4 papers that you could make into uh, small pyramids because it's totally stupid. So we were exhibiting that as art. And the police showed up because they were obsessed that pirate bay can't be in Italy. Uh, they didn't understand what Pirate Bay was, and they were looking for servers everywhere at the biggest art vinyl in the world, trying to find, shut down the Pirate Bay, and the only thing they could find is like pyramid papers. Uh, really, really funny. Um, so what happened after that is that people got so upset in Hollywood that they went to the White House, and they said, we need to take down these guys, and they were using our nicknames because they didn't have our names. And You know when you're being followed by a private investigator? Uh, it's really hard for them to understand what you're doing on the internet. Have you ever experienced that, that they're following you around? Uh, I did. It was really... Uh, they were so strange, these Hollywood people, sending actually three private investigators after three of us to find out like our real names, what we were doing, and where the pirate base servers were, which were on a picture on the internet. Uh, but also, like, if you follow a geek around for six weeks and you see him once, you should realize you won't not find out anything. Because people don't go out if they're druggies and geeks. Uh, anyhow, so... Long story short, uh, there was a big raid in Sweden after the meeting at the, at the, at the White House because the, the US government said to the Swedish government that if you don't take down with the Pirate Bay, we will stop allowing people to trade with you. We will trade sanction you in the World Trade Organization. We will not buy ABBA CDs. We will not buy Volvo cars. We will not buy all of your crappy shit. We will not you know, have your Swedish supermodels coming here and so on. Uh, and Swedish government ran home and said, well, it's, even though it's illegal for us to tell the prosecutors what to do, we will tell the prosecutor what to do. So there was a uh, in, in Sweden and they took um, all of our machines. Uh, and three days after they did this raid, we were back online. And the reason for three days is, first of all, there was party for two days. Uh, and then you're always supposed to resurrect on, after three days of something, right? Like Jesus. Um, so there was a big demonstration outside of the, the government in Sweden and it became very clear that there is a generational issue here, like people don't understand the new things or people in power don't understand the internet. So this picture says it all for me. And I, how many speak Swedish? One, I know two people and I see them. Three, ah, there's someone lying there as well. Um, so this picture says, give us back the server or we are going to take your fax machine. That's you know, how awful it was. So after kind of this thing, there was a, a long, boring thing called a court case, and it was a long investigation. Two and a half years went into investigation. Turned out that the Warner Brothers actually employed the police officer that did the investigation. Uh, and the guy who the judge in our case was also the chairman of the pro copyright society of Sweden paid for by Warner Brothers Which was an interesting case, uh, but in Sweden people are naive and think corruption does not exist uh, But we still uh, We kind of won the PR war and the reason we did it and a lot of people have been talking about branding I have built probably one of the biggest brands here uh, By doing stupid shit, so I'm going to tell you how to do that. So I'm going to show you a small clip from uh, this documentary again Till att börja med så tror jag inte på att det skulle finnas någon form av, av idé hos vanliga ungdomar om att upphovsrätt skulle vara fel eller så. Det, 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 det tror jag är en myt och den har, den har liksom de här, den här kopimistsekten varit väldigt duktiga på att marknadsföra. Ja, så this is the top lawyer for Hollywood in Europe and she's calling us a cult. Have you ever been called a cult member? Then you know it's kind of strange. And for me it was even more strange because she's very famous in Sweden because 
She's the top Hollywood lawyer, but she's also the top lawyer in Europe for this Church of Scientology. <laughs> so she should know what a cult is, right? So how do you respond to that? Well, they call those pirates, and we said, well, okay, let's call piracy something. Let's make that kind of cool. So I was thinking, could we do something cool about this? So this happened. This is wild. Some people seem uh, to worship technology, but now it's being recognized as a religion. Yes, in Sweden, a church whose central tenet is the right to file share has been formally recognized by the Swedish government. It's called the Church of Copy Meism. Uh, I guess Copy Meism or Copy Mism. Okay, and it claims that copy acting, sharing information through copying, is akin to a religious service. Yeah. So, if you ever want to start your own church, Sweden is a good country to do it in. Um, for 50 euros, you can re get basically anything registered as a church. And it has certain dimensions. Like, uh, first of all, we made it really cool to be a member of a cult. There's over 30,000 people that are members of the Church of, Scient of uh, Copimism. Uh, I almost said Scientology. We're not that, year, uh, that yet. But we will be one of those cults in the end, I hope. Um, and one of the... Th really interesting things about uh, being a church was that I found out that in the data retention directive that you might have heard of and ACTA and SUPA and all of these monitoring agreements and, and uh, the new laws and legislations that are coming out for uh, surveilling the internet, there's always one exception and that is for uh, confessions to your priest. So if you're talking to your priest, no one is allowed to store that communication or actually even listen into that because it, it's more important than, than anything else. Uh, because the religious lobbies has been going up and saying we, we need people to be able to trust our priests. So I was thinking, you know, the Mormon church, another church which is very inspiring for some reasons, they consider everyone to be a priest if they're a member. So we decided in the Church of Copimism, everyone is a priest. And then instead of P2P meaning peer-to-peer, -peer, we will have priest-to-priest -priest communication. <laughs> And that actually means that you will get four years in prison if you try to listen to your communication. So it's a good way. So I'm waiting for someone to get sued for file sharing in Sweden again so they will actually claim that, oh, you're breaking my religious rights. Uh, so that, that's kind of interesting. So um, if you take a more serious uh, topic of this, and it's uh, what, what happened with the internet that's been going on for a long while is that we're kind of living in a small lie about what the internet is. A lot of people are talking about the internet as something which are, is liberating us and making us part of a decentralized network and it's so great and it's, so, it's going to save everything and it's going to change everything and so on. And that was true for a small part of, the, of history, a very small window of time. Because then you had this really distributed network and so on and you still have that, like physically it's a distributed network. But like, if you go back seven, eight years, this is what the internet looked like. Like, these were the big websites on the internet. Do you remember? I can't even read this. Uh, like, okay, Facebook, you probably remember. Uh, but there was all of these big websites that were like really big. There was one called Orkut. Did you ever use that one? It was the second biggest website in the world. How many have even heard of it? Orkut, like. 20 people. So it was the Facebook before Facebook, and it was really, really huge. And it does not exist anymore because no one is using these services. So everything just got centralized. So you have like five companies that own 98% of the web today. And everyone here is talking about like you need to do build your stuff on top of these and these uh, APIs and, and apps on top of Google and Facebook and so on. And for me, that's totally wrong because we need to take back the control over the network because someone else is owning the networks. It's super centralized. And it's not that I'm especially against the United States as a country, even though the government is really against me as a person. Um, one country is dictating what we can and can't do on the internet, and that means that they're dictating what we can and can't do in real life. Um, for instance, uh, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't get invited to as many parties as everyone else, because you only use Facebook to invite people to parties. So because of the US government treating me as shit, I don't go to parties anymore, and I'm kind of an entertaining party guest. So. Uh, that is a problem that you're missing out on by being on Facebook. Uh, so for me, it is a problem that will just go on and become bigger and bigger. And you can see that in, in other things as well that are not necessarily only about like digital things, but things that are today analog will become digital most likely if there's a, a good enough technology for it, which will come. 
So like you've all seen 3D printers. And like five years ago, that was kind of unknown. And now everyone knows what a 3D printer is. And you can print small objects. And people are seeing it's a revolution in the clothing industry because you can do these, uh, lots of cool new arts, fartsy uh, clothing and so on. And uh, kind of a niche genre. But what's happening is that we know that in 15 years' time, we will actually download meat. We will download food. We will do all of these things. We can download a pair of pants. You can download a pair of shoes or whatever that you want, because that's where technology is going to. Because it's, ex it's so much faster, the, the development of, uh, of technology now than before, because computers are getting so much faster and so much cheaper. So every time in history, you will always have like this uh, kind of this diagram of where you are in history of, uh, in, in the uh, time of history. And you will always see that you're standing in the front. But we know that for a fact that this is the curve that we're looking at. So in 2035, we will invent so much new technology in one month that it equals all of the technology we ever had before in history. That's kind of the speed change. And we're like standing right now at kind of the, the super up arrow. And we're allowing certain companies to control and own all of the infrastructure, and all of the information, and everything that we're going to have in the future. And just like, if you look at it in a really, like, um, you dig down to like a small uh, niche, you have like self-driving cars, uh, which in just 10 years ago, people said, like the top researchers and scientists in the world said, it's impossible, we will never have that. No matter what happens, we can't have self-driving cars on normal roads. And six years later, Google has been the most successful car ever in history. They had the least amount of accident by any driver in history of time. And that's in six years' time. And next year, you can actually buy a self-driving car in most of the European countries. It would be legal to drive a self-driving car. You will actually just sit in it. And for me, this uh, raises certain questions, like who is able to build these cars? And can I put a normal car on the road? Because in most likely it will be illegal for a normal person to drive a car because it would be unsafe. And then who's controlling the infrastructure going into these cars? And thinking about things that are going on on the internet and how everything is converging into being one sort of network, like cars and internet, everything, internet of things, it's just making us to one big uh, kind of uh, same network. Probably you've heard about all of the blocking attempts against the Pirate Bay. And they always, always fail. It's Probably because, first of all, the people in the internet providers, they don't want to block Pirate Bay. And then people behind Pirate Bay are kind of clever, or they used to be when I was part of it. Um, but every time there's been some sort of blocking attempt, someone stole the domain name and the government seizes a domain name, which just happened in Sweden, um, there's been a workaround. But we can't always do workarounds because most people can't follow the workaround. Maybe in this case you can. But what happens, for instance, when, um, when you lose... Um, what happened there? Uh, so when you lose the domain name uh, to government, because of like in Sweden, uh, the piratebay.se was uh, just seized um, for criminal behavior or something like that. So same day that happened, uh, the, Swe the biggest banks in Sweden got fined and uh, in a criminal charge because they have not been doing enough against, mo uh, against money laundering. So I sent the letter to the government saying like, you have to take away the domain names of the big banks. Uh, because they're doing crimes, so you have to take away that domain name, and using the same logic. But I, I went a little bit further than that, and I also said, like, uh, there is a law in the European Union saying that like, all of the stuff, all of the laws has to be technology neutral, so that has to be neutral towards what kind of technology it is. So I actually um, sent a letter, a formal complaint to the land registry of Sweden, saying, like, you actually have to take all of the addresses out for these bank offices from the registry. People are not allowed to go to these places. Just as you can't go to the website, you're not allowed to go to the physical location uh, by doing this. Because I wanted to show that in the future, maybe we'll have uh, censored data in GPSs and the map systems because someone has sold something illegal there. And I'm really afraid of that because that's what's going to happen. So for me, all of the activism that came from like hacking and, and doing all of the internet stuff, I realized that uh, Basically, what I'm interested in is politics, and I'm doing it in a kind of humorous and artsy-fartsy way because that's fun and that's how I work. But I actually tried last year, while I was, uh, in, I was still wanted by Interpol for two and a half years, and was last year, uh, I decided I have to do something about that because it's not that fun being in, well, it's kind of fun being wanted by Interpol. Uh, funny fact, for a few months, we were four out of my friends on the Interpol most wanted list. Uh, five of them in, in Sweden, you know, in total, four of us were friends of mine. Um, that's just funny. 
Uh, but what happened is that I decided I would run for the European Union uh, 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 parliamentarian system because there was an election for the uh, European Union. And I was not really interested in doing as every other politician. I, I'm not really a politician. I just care about a few things. But it's kind of fun to make people realize that you have to care about certain things. So I saw all of the ads for uh, other politicians that what they were doing, and most of them were talking shit about other politicians, which they always do, and some of them were lying, which they always do. So I wanted to have like a different uh, kind of uh, vibe to my campaign. And first I went out to the media and I told them like, uh, actually I'm wanted in Sweden and by Interpol because of my involvement in what no one seems to, to actually look at as a crime. So everyone wants me to be free. And the Swedish government is not very popular in Finland. Uh, Finnish people actually hate Sweden because they've invaded Sweden or Finland a couple of times and they always treat Finland as shit. So I told the Finnish people, if you really want to piss off people in Sweden, you should vote for me. <laughs> and I got a lot of votes, a lot of votes, which was really interesting. It's a good way to, to do that. But the thing that got me the most amount of votes is the video I'm going to end with before we have a small chat. Um, and it's just super awful. So if you, if you have a pillow, put it over your face right now. Uh, but I'm gonna end on that. That's actually through European Union election history, that's the most viewed video. I'm not sure if I'm proud of that or not, but it was funny. Awkward okay, silence. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were all so smitten by our good looks, so it was a moment of contemplation. So, my friend that cut that video for me, he didn't want to see me for like two weeks afterwards. <laughs> It's like so tired of me. And I, I you know, I, I have the same feeling quite often. Okay, so thank you for a great speech. Uh, before we begin our chat, there's just one thing I want to say. Uh, about a week ago, uh, SparkMe lost a potential partner who told us that they do not want to be our partner because Peter Sunde is on our speakers list. Now, I've been advised that I cannot name them because it was not a written contract, it was the final contract negotiation stage, so formally we cannot accuse them of such, but basically when it was down to the signing they said, we really, really are for copyrights and Peter Sunde is on your speakers list and we don't want to do that, but if you would remove him, we would be very happy to be your partner. So, like we told them and I want to tell them once again, basically there's no middle finger big enough, so fuck you very much. Okay. There's a very, very positive thing you said recently at the conference and I quote, the internet will keep getting destroyed, we tried, we sucked and now we are old. Yes, yeah. Um, one of the things that I've been uh, realizing more and more is that uh, kind of the positive attitude towards the internet is so wrong. And by having that attitude, we're not actually trying to fix issues that we have. So people are like super happy about the new APIs that are coming out from Google or from Facebook and so on. They don't realize like there is an issue for us when we allow them to have that control. Uh, and it's a slippery slope that I'm really, really not happy about. And especially like a lot of people in the startup industry, they're they don't even think about this. And for me, that's really dangerous. Uh, but I also like to, when people call me something, I usually go with it. And I try to, okay, so if you call me extremist, I'm going to be the most extreme extremist. Because that's kind of a way to show that something is wrong. Um, so I actually wanted people to vote for Sarah Palin in the last US election. Because then the country would be destroyed so much faster, right? Because there's inevitably, they will end in a shitty place. And I think the same is, is kind of my, my view on internet right now, is that, if we blow it up faster, 
we can restart with something that actually works and is more democratic and more fair. But you also said that we are lazy and entitled, so are we able to do that? Well, when I said we are lazy and entitled, I, it's probably me, first of all, I'm very lazy and entitled. But then again, especially in uh, Western Europe, we're super lazy, we're super entitled, and we are super privileged. And it's really hard to give away the privileges you have in order for some people that don't have them, that are not used to them, uh, getting them. And, and that's, uh, that's just part of the whole capitalistic society. That, that's how it works. Um, so I don't really see a way out of it. That's the problem. Well, uh Paul Papadimitriou in his uh, presentation today said that we really need heroes and we talked about it last night yeah. and we al you also said we need heroes. Now he suggested Elon Musk, is he a hero? For me he's not. I can understand why he's saying that. And uh, For me he's a super rich guy that uses a small amount of his money and a small amount of his time to buy PR for himself. And he's doing good in the way he's doing those things. But um, by building, okay, uh, is, do we really need a new car? maybe we should have something else than cars. Even if a car that runs on batteries are better for the environment, uh, it's just l it's not better really, it's just the least bad thing we could do. So maybe we should find alternatives. And the problem is that we're very often putting like uh, duct tape on things. We're trying to fix this by putting some tape on it and then we're not looking at why does it break all the time? What's the problems? Like why is the world so unequal? Why do we have all of the coal? Why do we have all of the energy needs that we're doing? Why do people drive so much cars? Like, instead of fixing the cost, you're trying to treat the symptoms all the time. And I think that's the problem with, with uh, Elon Musk and other people like, like him. Uh, but he's, he's the least bad guy from Silicon Valley right now. Could Cory Doctorow be one? Cory Doctorow is awesome. Um, but he pisses me off all the time as well because he has so much energy. And like, I finished one of his books and he's written two new more when I was at the toilet or something. He's so productive. <laughs> so it pisses me off. I'm not, I'm not happy with that. Actually, I met him in Berlin a few, like three weeks ago, and he came with, I, I just finished his last book, and he's like, here's the script for my new book. And I'm like, okay, so I have another like a printed document, and I'm like, okay. Uh, but he's awesome, and I think we need people like that. Uh, but when you were talking about what some of the people could do, uh, you said, uh, and I quote again, you are not interesting, you are not the product, you are the wallet. Yes. How do we transition from the wallet back to people? No, I, the, the, so uh, do any of you know how much money Google is making on you? Like you as an individual, how much? No, that's not true. But uh, they would really like that. But it's $1 per month per user they have is their actual profit. And would you pay $2 per month or even $1 per month for a service that gives you everything that Google does, it would give you them, but you would have your privacy and your integrity, would you pay $1 per month for that? Is that? Yeah, most people would, but you, yeah. But, yeah. So for me, it's the problem is that we're not looking at kind of the, the actual cost of free. And we don't understand that we are a wallet. So if we don't actually start looking at that as a problem, we're not going to change that because you have to have the mindset of, of that being a problem. But we, we don't really have that, that thing because we have this idea that we are unimportant as people. Like me as an individual, I'm not very important. I can't change things. Um, I can't really, uh, you know, I have nothing to hide, which is my most hated argument. Like I have nothing to hide. But the thing is, you have nothing to hide right now, right? So that will change in time. Um, and you can't go back with that. So it's really, you know, if we could actually pay for the services or do something else, it doesn't have to be about money. It has to be about not giving money to people and giving control to people. Okay. Um, I want to go back uh, to some of the topics we've covered uh, in the sessions before lunch. They were talking a lot about startups. Now, you tweeted a very, very interesting thing I'm a recently quote machine. when you said, uh, the Swedish right wing wants to, organ wants to make organized begging illegal, which is bad news for Kickstarter, Indiegogo, etc. because today's entrepreneurs beg quite a lot. Yeah, they do. Uh, and for, for me, that, that's, you know, if you're a beggar, just put up a sign saying, I want one billion, and people will say, he's an entrepreneur, he's not a beggar anymore. Um, so there's that, the difference between a startup and a beggar is just the amount of money you're asking for. Okay, uh, 
one more thing before we open it up for questions. Now people talk. <laughs> uh, you are an artist and you have been working a lot on your art recently. Is there something you can share with us or something that we can expect in the near future? Well, uh, so I'm doing a lot of weird art projects. It's not like physical art most of the time. I'm doing a lot of like uh, digital art and, and, and such, which is uh, the hype right now in the art world. Uh, and I can just tell you that the, the, the kind of project I'm working on mostly right now, uh, I've, lost, I've sent out letters to some uh, lawyers asking for like legal advice, what do you think about this? And they just reply back, I don't want any to be involved in this. Uh, and they're, they're lawyers. So I've gone through a lot of lawyers the past months, which uh, I think is, uh, I'm on the it's right track. It's a good track. sign, yeah. There's it's a good sign. A good I'm sign. totally, so you will probably read about it when I'm at, <laughs> so I'm writing a book as well. I'm doing a lot of things. That's why I never finish anything. Uh, but I'm writing a book and the first book name, the book title I had in mind was From Pirate Bay to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, <laughs> but now I'm just calling it Lord of the Files instead. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to open it up for questions. Hands up, please. A few questions. We have more than enough. Darko, over here. Hi, me again. One short question. How do you make for a living money something? Well, uh, me personally, I have some uh, different projects that I've started that's, uh, that's working, and I'm working for them. And, uh, uh, and I also get some grants, and I go to different conferences and speak, and sometimes I get paid for that as well. Yeah, thanks for that. Here comes fellow tree hugger Natasha. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, can you say something about the Silk Road and uh, Ross Ulbricht, the, the sentence that he was yeah, from the yeah. yesterday? Oh, uh, I actually, we and talked Aaron about Swartz this. Aaron Swartz also. Oh, yeah, Aaron, Aaron was, oh, that's, uh, that's really depressive. Aaron Swartz, I don't know if you people know about Aaron Swartz. Um, so for those who don't know, Aaron was uh, one of the big guys behind uh, the, um, most of the Stop Acta, Stop Supa, Stop Pipa stuff in the US. He's been working against the DRM and internet censorship and net for net neutrality and so on in the US. And he, um, he committed suicide after being pressured by the government because he, uh, he released a lot of actually free documents that were available on, uh, on the university intranet uh, where he was going studying. And he downloaded all of them and put them up on, on the internet for people to download. And he got sued and uh, they were threatening him with 10 years in prison. And he got so depressed that he committed suicide. So um, and that's just like showing that it, it's really insane um, how the government is pressuring people because there's so much pressure on you if you go outside of controlling um, well, their control. And what people need to realize is that um, why people are so scared of what's going on on the internet is that internet is the biggest business we've ever seen in the history of mankind. Uh, like o the oil industry is nothing compared to the information industry. Like Apple is worth twice the amount of money on the stock exchange as the biggest oil company in the world. And they have more money than any other companies ever had in the, in the history of the world as well. And the big difference is when you have oil, you have, an, you have a, a scarcity of, uh, of resources. But with internet and with information, there's abundance. Every time someone is born, you have a new customer. Uh, and that's not the case in any other business. Um, and so that's why control over the internet is so crucial because all of the other businesses are building on top of the internet. So uh, that's why the governments are so upset when they see people like uh, Ross Albrecht from Silk Road or from Aaron Swartz and so on kind of threatening their control over it. In the case of Ross, uh, he was the operator of uh, Silk Road, which is uh, this w marketplace on the deep, uh, the dark nets on the, on the internet where you could buy basically anything. You could buy guns, you could buy hitmen, you can buy um, uh, um, drugs and so on. And he got sentenced a few, like a week ago, I think, a few days ago, he got sentenced to life in prison for uh, drugs, part of drug sales, I think, was the biggest thing, um, which is totally insane. And it's been a really unfair trial. Uh, I'm not for Ross, Ross as a person. I think he did a lot of really stupid, really illegal stuff, and he should probably go to jail. I don't think that you should go to jail for life for doing that. So, but that's kind of the, the, the nuances here. I, was, I had a fight with Julian Assange about this on, on Twitter. He was really upset about me for saying like, we need heroes, but we don't need Ross Olbart as a hero because he's not a hero, he's a businessman. And, and Julian Assange was really upset with me for not you know, agreeing with him that he's a hero just because he's been 
uh, fucked over by the government. And not everyone who gets fucked over by the government is a hero. Uh, a few people are, like um, Aaron Swartz was definitely a hero for, and, and should be treated as a hero. But then again, Ross Albrecht is definitely not one. So we need to have some more nuances about that. Yeah. Uh, hi, Peter. Uh, Hello. Uh, last time I saw you know, in Belgrade on a share conference, and um, we had that awesome wedding uh, under Copenhagen Church, and oh, it yeah. was great. People uh, actually got married in my church. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So before you st ask the question, I have to tell you the story about that because it's actually yes, I'm, so. Uh, I was there with uh, Isaac, and, uh, the guy who's like the formerly did all of the paperwork for the church and so on. And this couple comes to us and asks if we want to help them get married as the first cop uh, copy mist wedding ever. And I'm sitting there like, uh, first of all, I don't believe in marriage. And Isaac says he's 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 not into marriage either, and they're like kind of upset. Uh, and then I asked one of the people, like, you do understand this church is a joke, right? <laughs> and he's looking at me and he goes, you're testing me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now there's like different branches of the church that split out because they don't like the original one. Schism. This is how you start a cult. It's a really funny part. Sorry for... Yeah. yeah, but it was great. It was, we had a speech there. It was a ring. The, it was real wedding. Uh, but it was my lasers. Question, we yeah. had lasers. <laughs> my question is, uh, where are we today? So where is our awareness? And do we really need to sink down and to rise again? Or what will happen? Well, I, I think we need to blow shit up. Uh, quite a lot. Like, I'm for innovation of Facebook. Like, we should just take Facebook from uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, we can't really invade the country of Facebook, even though it's the biggest country in the world. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is the biggest dictator in the world. He has one and a half billion people that he's uh, the dictator of. You're spending more time there than you're doing in most other countries. Um, so we don't have in, even have like a, a movement against Facebook or against Mark Zuckerberg. Someone probably started a Facebook group saying, people <laughs> who don't like Facebook and you like it. It's like, it's not going to work. So I think the only thing, yeah, we need to be totally extremist about this. We need to either blow the shit up or we need to, yeah, we, it needs to go away somehow. And I don't think that we're going to do that by saying like, oh, I have the right to my privacy. You know, that's not going to happen. Yeah, you have the right. But in practice, it doesn't matter if you have a law saying like you own your data. It doesn't matter whatever, because in practice, you don't have that. And the people in charge are not going to be interested in giving, you know, that privacy back to you. So I... Revolutions are cool, you know, somehow. I shouldn't say that in this country, maybe, or in this region of the world, but for some people that are not part of, uh, not been part of a revolution, I'm looking forward to one. Thank you. Okay, next question. Pezia. Hi, Peter. Hello. So what, yes, ha what, what happened with your server and fax machine from Swedish government? So did you finish that exchange? Oh, no, 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 no. We haven't stolen the fax machine yet. We should maybe do that. I forgot about that. Um, but uh, some servers were actually given away at, from the evidence room to the Swedish museum. So they are exhibiting stolen machines from us uh, as uh, historical pieces of, of things, uh, which is kind of interesting. Another museum was so jealous that they asked if they had the first server we had, so we gave that to them, um, which is kind of strange. Yeah, the fax machine, yeah, it's on the to-do list to steal, uh, amongst other things to steal. Uh. Can I ask one question? Where are you? Tjena, Peter. Tjena, tjena. Tack så mycket. Varsågod. Really interesting story, as you can see. Uh, my question is, what is the next, what is your next activity? I mean, we see that you are a problem maker even here in Montenegro, and that you are an artist, you write a book, uh, I don't know, politics, so romantic, etc. So... What is one thing you would really love to change in the world, except this Facebook stuff, etc.? What <laughs> can you share with us? Okay. I mean, I know it's a lot of them, but uh, there's a lot. Of, like the, the one thing that I, I know that there are Danish people in this room, so I'm not going to try to offend them too much. But I want Denmark to stop allowing sex with animals. That's one of the things I'm working most on. <laughs> what, what about le legalizing uh, alcohol in Sweden? Legalizing what? To not have monopoly on, on alcohol. No, I think that might actually be good. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Vises po fika? What? Vises po fika? fika? Vises po fika? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, we'll do that afterwards. 
Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Next no, but question. seriously, if, if I'm going to be a little bit more serious, one of the two things that I'm working mostly on is that I'm doing a TV show about activism this year, which I hope to go around different parts of the world to see different activist groups and, and document when working with them. So instead of just being documentarian, it's going to be like a... Uh, I'm going to work with them, and if they're going to cross borders into North Korea, I will cross borders into North Korea, and I will be their stupid Scandinavian that thinks everything is fine, because that's what I do. Uh, and and I also, I, I was in prison for six months last year, uh, which was kind of an interesting uh, experience, where I've told the story already to you, but uh, I, I when I got to prison, they asked me for my autograph, uh, the guards working there, which was strange. Uh, <laughs> Then they asked me to undress as well, uh, so I could put on their clothes and uh, threaten me with uh, solitary cells if I didn't do that. I farted one guard in the face uh, for asking, he asked me if he could look up my ass, I said no, and then I farted him in the face. Um, but the thing I spent a lot of time on was actually writing a sitcom. So uh, I, I think about entrepreneurs actually, um, it's called the entrepreneurs. Um, so I hope to get that produced this year. We need to change the title, then they can, we can look for a producer. Yeah, yeah. I've the book title I, was much better. Yeah, but Entrepreneurs is kind of funny. <laughs> uh, I will tell you later the story about it, because it's secret, because, uh, you know, it, it's totally disgusting. Kelly. Yeah. So, Peter, when you talk about how we need to blow up the... Ex Hi. <laughs> I have to talk about the blowing up the existing internet and starting over. Yes. In a scenario where that doesn't happen, where we work with the the existing internet that we have, what can individual users, like all of us in the room, do to affect positive change, to turn the tide of what's happening now, and to essentially take, I mean, I said, you know, that where's my privacy, you know, isn't, isn't going to cut it. Yeah. But how, you know, what do you see as a road to actually getting there and actually getting an internet that, that works for everyone? Or, well, you know, almost everyone, you know? I honestly, I don't see that happening. To be totally honest, I don't see that happening. We could probably minimize the harm that we are, uh, we're getting. Uh, you can do that by using encryption services and encrypting your email. Uh, well, but that's more making a statement that you care about things. It, you're not actually changing things. Uh, do people know about PGP? Which is uh, it's what people use to encrypt emails with. It's been used since the 70s. It's kind of good privacy uh, thing to do. Four million people have ever used PGP. It's nothing. like. On WhatsApp, you have half a billion people using WhatsApp, or even more now, I think. Um, so even though we've had it since the 70s, we had all of the tools for encryption, we had all of these tools, we didn't start using them. So that, that you know, made it impossible to actually adopt them. So um, I, don't, I don't think that we're going to change things. I, I, I Usually I compare kind of the situation with, uh, with sexually transmitted diseases, like uh, HIV. So yeah, you can use a condom to not spread HIV around when you have sex with someone, and you can use encryption to not get spied on, but you're not solving the issue, you're not curing HIV as you're not curing Facebook. Um, so so that, that's kind of the, the thing I'm seeing. So I'm, I'm really realistic when I say that we are fucked. <laughs> and not in a good way, fucked. Well, let's You showed the slide uh, talking about the level of technological progress and yeah. what we expect to see in the, in the next 20 years and basically coincides with the singularity theory stuff that Ray Kurzweil was talking yeah. about and so on. Do you think it will make it easier or harder for people to be free around that much sophisticated technology? Well, we, we haven't been free in ages, so I, I don't see that as um, more or less. We are totally not free, and we're not going to be more free by technology. Because the thing people need to understand is that technology will not be fixed with other technology, because the, the kind of we're patching technology. So like when you add a self-driving car, when you add all of these different things that we're going to see in just the, like, the upcoming years, um, it's going to put restrictions on you. So like today you can sit in a car and drive it, and in the future you will not be able to drive it, but you will have like the freedom of going anywhere without a driver's license. So it has different kind of, of values to what you put in the word freedom. Uh, but we have kind of changed our um, understanding of, 
of what the word freedom is. Like the most free thing you do as a person is traveling around the world. That's like if you were really free and you were living in the Schengen region, you would be able to go anywhere you want. But you have to go to the most unfree uh, instance uh, in an uh, institution in the country, which is the airport, which is scanning you, your body, everything, checking that you're not a dangerous person. Uh, don't play that again. Uh, <laughs> So, so I, I think that uh, you know we're not going to be more free by having more tools uh, around like that. We need to look at the core problem. Okay, time for one last question. Do we have one? No. Yeah, oh, there's a here. Timo, can we get? Can we wait for the microphone, please? It's coming. Thanks. So, will it be running for European Parliament in the future? Or is that something you're planning? Uh, no, I don't think so. It was a it was a fun thing to do. I had more videos that I didn't publish because I I, I, I was too ashamed of them. This was the least bad of them. But uh, yeah, I, I think for me, I'm I'm not a politician. I, I like being able to have my actual freedom of not being able to talk or have to talk for other people. I can talk for myself. Uh, I know a lot of people in here, like you are working for different companies and you have brands and everything and you, like, you could actually say no to the sponsor, but other sponsors you need to treat nicely. I don't have that. I can tell shit about anything, which makes me totally free. But if you're running uh, for the European Union you know, or like a, a politician, you have responsibility. I don't want that responsibility. I want less responsibility. So it was kind of fun and, and my idea was that if I got elected, I would probably give the seat away to someone that, is, that would be number two on the list, something like that. Or I would go there like, uh, and just fuck everything up, which would also be funny for a while and then leave. Um, but, but that is also my role. Um, I'm not, I think that for me it's important to get attention from people about thinking about stuff, right? And when then you, know, you can look at me as some sort of extremist. And then the guy who previously was the extremist is a little bit closer to you. So you look at him as a rational moderate guy, like Cory Doctorow is really rational, a really moderate person that people listen to, because there is someone who's so much more crazy, more far away than he is. And uh, we all have our tasks, and I don't want to be the guy in the middle, it's boring. Uh, so I, I, I'd be happy to be the extremist in that case. You do realize that now that you've said there are more videos, the world is going to beg you to show the other N videos? No, they are not. <laughs> I will show them to one person, and then that person will commit suicide or something, and that's <laughs> how awful it is. Okay, uh, so we are at the end of our segment. There's just one more thing I want to say. Uh, Peter's, one of Peter's goals is to visit every country in Europe and there are only two left, Bulgaria and Albania. So we have people from those countries here. So if you want to hear a talk that was that is going to be as awesome or even more awesome than this one, you will know what to do. Call the guy, make his wish come true. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.